Welcome back to The Exemplist on the Zero Blitz podcast feed. I'm Charles McDonald. Today we are talking about the divisional round, the AFC Championship games, and me getting old taste exposed for the first time. Uh, we're going to be joined by former NFL offensive lineman Marshall Newhouse, and we're going to get right into it. Welcome to The Exemplist, part of Zero Blitz podcast family, presented by Prime. Today, I'm joined by 11-year NFL vet, Super Bowl champion, my friend, Marshall Newhouse. How's it going? Bro, it's good, man. How are you? Doing good. I'm uh, I'm like halfway in between. This is the best part of the season because we have games with stakes and only good teams left. And also, I'm kind of ready for this to be over because I'm tired <laughs> uh, and it's been a long season and like February 13th can't come fast enough at the same time. I'm sure a lot of people are feeling the same way as me, uh, but I'm glad to have you on. Glad to be able to talk about uh, all this playoff nonsense. And like I said in the intro, starting off with nonsense, I got old takes exposed uh, mm-hmm. this weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, the genius, the most powerful brain in the entire planet, gave the Detroit Lions an F for their draft grade last Ooh. year. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't just give them a C or a D. You gave them an no. F. No, I gave them an F because, look, I feel like you have to start from the standpoint that most drafts are going to be bad. So I was just like, uh, I don't. I really didn't like this one. I thought that they had like a perfect opportunity because they had, like walking into the draft, they had like the sixth in the 18th pick. And I was like, damn, like you could, and we knew that the Cardinals wanted to trade down. So it's like, shoot, you should package those picks. You could get yourself a quarterback with like, without blowing future years because you have this capital right here. And they decided to trade down and it took Jameer Gibbs, Jack Campbell in the first round. And then it took Sam Laporta and Brian Branch in the second round. And right now it looks like they have like three Pro Bowl players out of those four. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Laporta had, just had like the best rookie tight end season maybe we've ever seen. Brian Branch was automatically impact safety. Jameer Gibbs helped change their offense. Jack Campbell struggled a little bit, but like, shoot, I could not have looked any dumber than I possibly did. Even though I still don't, I still look when when they pay Jared Goff that fifty five million dollar a year contract, hmm. and I get to come back in three years and say. See, you maxed out. You should have just gone and got Anthony Richardson, like I said, three years ago. That will be my point of uh, being correct and not being like the biggest idiot on the planet. So in, in the world of what we've basically come to realize that the draft is like a bunch of uh, dartboards and guesses, like educated guesses, but guesses. Um, they weren't just mid, man. They hit, you know, if at a, those seven picks, eight picks, they hit three home runs, another potential home run. And that's just one year. You know, Brad Holmes, you know, he's getting his due now. Everyone's glazing him up, but, like, deservedly so. Like, he has stacked three straight drafts um, and do what you – you know, this is how you build sustained success because ultimately, you know, the teams that don't draft well are going to be the ones that have to be the most active in free agency. Your your cap situation gets upside down, and you, you see it compound over years. But when you can build, you can take advantage of value in these rookie deals – especially at, at prime positions uh, that gives you a chance to build a balanced team, a competitive team. And the lines are here to stay just on multiple fronts, but specifically on, on young personnel, man, it's crazy. Yeah. See that, that, but see, that's, I guess that's why I thought at the time they should have gone because like Brad had done such a good job of building out the team. I'm like, now you have a chance to like really blow the roof off this thing. If you, you know, cause I, I, I mean, I still do view Anthony Rich as someone who has like super high upside and yeah, it would have been a risk, but, uh, it seems like things have, have worked out pretty well for them. I mean, it's hard to look at, like, what Jameer Gibbs is doing on Sunday and what Laporta did all season and say, oh, you guys, you guys f***ed it up entirely. For sure. And, you know, so much of that comes down to, like, fit and 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 what Dan Campbell has brought to the organization um, and instilled in this team. Because you look back, you know, to, to three years ago, Panay Sewell, he's the type of – guy you know he's a lineman yeah but he's the type of guy attitude wise ability wise that it appears Dan Campbell was looking for now was he that when he was drafted specifically 
maybe, maybe not. And does it get molded when it gets there? But when you have a vision and an idea of what you're looking for, getting a guy who's got the mental makeup, at least, you know, if he's got, if we're talking points on a scale of, or a talent on a scale of 100, if he's got one to two to three less talent points, but he's got four or five, six more fit points of what you're looking for, that's incredible value. And uh, a guy like Sewell, and then you do Aiden Hutchinson, who I had doubts about, you know, being number two overall pick uh, as, as a pass rush in the end, those guys have to be game wreckers. And, you know, I don't know if you classify him yet as a game wrecker, but the last two months he's been showing up. 11 and a half sacks this season, getting consistent pressure in the playoffs. Um, he's coming into his own. I don't know how much him just being home and being comfortable. Literally, as, you know, 50 miles playing high school, college, and pro ball of where you grew up. That must give you some kind of benefit. So you, you, you couple in him two, year, two years ago in that draft and then this past year's draft, and they're just – they're hitting. But they're hitting on guys that they, you know, see a fit with, that they – can really mold and shape into the the kind you know the Lions way. When we talk about Bill Belichick and the Patriots way, it's just a it's a crass way of just saying this is who we're looking for with physical and mental traits, and they they they've been hidden. Yeah, I, I'm I just pulled up their draft history now, and it's kind of crazy what Brad Holmes has the, the players to draft Brad Holmes have been able to add. 2021, his first year there, uh, Panay Sewell was his first mm-hmm. pick. Uh, third round, they came back with Lee McNeil, who's been a contributor for them on the defensive line. I'm on Ross St. Brown in the fourth round. Next year, you'll get Aiden Hutchinson, Jameson Williams, who's trying to come into his own as well. Uh, and even got someone like Kirby Joseph, who's been a pretty good player for them in the secondary lately. And then this year, Jameer Gibbs, Sam Laporta, Brian Branch. It's a That's a pretty good job. It's something that's really difficult to do, which is consistently identify talent in the draft. And he's been able to figure it out on the, you know, I'm really all three days because it's like I'm on Rossi Brown. He's a day three pick in the fourth round. So pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, just in general, what were your thoughts on the Lions victory over the Buccaneers? Um, and really what I wanted to ask you is like when you get into situations where uh, like in the first half when Baker was taking a lot of sacks and some negative plays, like how hard can it be to dig yourself out of that, especially against a team that can kind of score whenever they want to like the Lions can? I mean, it, it, in the moment, you know, you're like, ah, you know, sacks seem and they are, you know, detrimental and you, you don't like them. And um, as if as a protection unit, you're, you're, you're kind of see where are we breaking down? Is this covered sack? Are they just how they dialed us in for a little bit or do we make adjustments? Um, but you'd rather sacks than interceptions, especially in the playoffs. All these possessions are so pivotal. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, Baker was was taking some pressure and they had some sacks, but <clears throat> the game was tied you know that they were right there in the game and ultimately I think they you saw them hunting for opportunities to get Mike Evans the ball in one-on-one matchups and they finally did and um you know when when you can do you have you have a playmaker you know like this is our difference maker we don't want to force them early but when we can take our shot you take your shot so Tampa made it a game but I think Detroit when they had their opportunity they put their foot on their neck and and the playoffs, it, it, it's it's told all the time, but like each possession and the gravity of explosive plays or um, game changing plays is three x. It's just everything matters so much more. And in the second half, Tampa made more of those errors, uh, even with you know put, dropping the ball in Mike Evans' hands. You know, Detroit came out you know a little bit more intent. I think they were intent on like getting back to what they do. Well, they weren't panicking. I think we've seen video of, of Dan Campbell after the game, just like, Hey, yeah, it, was, it was tied at half. That's the playoffs. And he's completely right. Like there's no clean, clean game out there. You, these games are, could end up being a one point game. It's just the best of the best, but Detroit outlasted. Uh, they kept running the ball, which I was happy with. I mean, Jameer Gibbs was, you know, we were unsure of his production value, because they took time integrating him into the offense early in the season. We're like, man, where's Jameer Gibbs? Give him the ball more, give him the ball more. And it's obvious they had a plan for him. Like, you know, they knew exactly what they had in him. And you saw it in the second half when they were running just a basic, you know, out of 12 personnel, uh, two tight end, like a zone with a fullback lead. 
Um, and he cuts it back, and then he's one-on-one with a safety, and then outruns the safety. Like, he hit, the safety has the angle, and he outruns him, passes him, and beats him to the pylon. It's like, so they understood what they had. They didn't panic. They just made less of the mistakes. Um, they trusted Goff when they needed to trust Goff. And the rest of these guys, these draft picks, this depth they built on this team, attrition-wise, just won out. And it feels like they have an ultimate belief and that their squad and the way it's built and the players that are come, come into play will make the right play at the right time and we'll find this little area of arbitrage, this little area of advantage, and we'll take advantage, we'll strike, and we'll get up on you. And then you saw what happened. They're up two, two touchdowns, and Tampa didn't, didn't know what to do. Yeah, but the Jameer Gibbs stuff is interesting because I feel like at the start of the season, they almost like overthought like what kind of player he is because when they draft him like yeah we're getting an offensive weapon we're gonna use him all over the place when it, it kind of turns out he's just a really good running back <laughs> at the end of the day which is obviously a great thing to have especially when you already have guys uh like Laporta and Amon Ross St. Brown on your roster uh and I I guess like the next step for them is and the Lions is obviously win the Super Bowl you're right here Let's try to get it done but now you're going to start extending guys. Like Amon Ra, he's going to be up for a new deal either this offseason or the next one. The Jared Goff deal is coming up. Uh, Panay Sewell, you're going to have to pick up his option and prepare for paying him down the road. So, like, the 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 next test, I guess, for Brad Holmes and them is like, all right, well, how do you start building this out once guys start getting paid? And it's a good problem to have because if you're hitting on draft picks enough where you need to hit, hand out some second contracts and not let them walk out the door – Clearly, some part of your process is right. So, Brad Holmes, one, Charles, minus like 10 for the F <laughs> draft grade. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope you end up in the, in the, the war room like this mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he, Brad's probably like, man, I can't believe a black person saying this about me. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. Did nothing to do with you, Brad. I was just a really big fan of Anthony Richardson. Maybe that would still be right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. It's just because uh, honestly, I didn't even know that I was old takes exposed until Stone texted me yesterday. Oh. Because the the my my interactions with Twitter have kind of gone down a little bit with all of the. It really is just the bots, dude. It's the bots. Yeah. Like I I tweet. I tweet something like really wholesome and normal, and next thing I know, I've got like a you know a rated R picture flooded underneath yeah, my tweets dang. or the gambling bots. I'm like, dude, like every I other man wanna... is like a, a weed gummy. I'm like, bro, what are y'all out here doing? I got one for a vibrator yesterday. I was like, <laughs> my search <laughs> history, I am not Jason Whitlock, okay? My search <laughs> history is not that nasty. Not that nasty. But I digress. Okay. One another funny thing from the sports weekend outside of me getting exposed. The guy who looked just like Martin Luther King at the Ravens game. <laughs> did you, did you saw this, right? It was like two black dudes, right? No, I think it was only one. It was one guy oh, and like they he called him. The lady. He was with the old yes. lady. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they called him like looking up at the camera and like the side profile. Because sometimes they'll be like, you guys are bugging. Like, it doesn't really. <laughs> but no, like he really did look like, look like Martin Luther King to the point where like my brother, he's, he's a reformed Ravens fan, I would say. Like he was a Ravens fan and then. Cause we we I went to high school outside Baltimore, so from okay. the area, and he was a Ravens fan, and I think he kind of got bored with it towards the end of the Joe Flacco stuff. And then when Lamar came in, he's he's all the way back in. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was never down blah, 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 whatever. He sent a picture to like our family group chat of you know like all these civil rights icons <laughs> like staring out to the distance, and at the bottom of Lamar's face is is photoshopped in. It was like wow, <laughs> th this is like we've really come full circle on this meme where. The civil rights leaders have come back to life to watch Lamar Jackson play football against CJ Stroud and D'Amico Ryan's. Like, look at the equality. Look at <laughs> look how far we've come with, okay, with okay, just looking down on us, like, man, I got Jonathan Majors out here invoking my wife's name. And then people disrespecting me again on the on, on this day that, that you celebrate me, misquoting me, misinterpreting my my intentions. And then I got this brother at the game cheering on the Ravens, man. I don't know. You know, he looked down in disgust. He he had to come back and make sure that Lamar Jackson could see this game through to the finish line. So <laughs> so we, we can get our, our super black champion in the Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> but just in general, what did you think about? 
like Lamar's performance on, on Sunday because I was at the game. The second half was, man, like he was just in so complete control of what was going on. What were your thoughts on, on how he played and really, you know, thoughts on the Ravens moving forward? Yeah, that was just, you know, <clears throat> evidence of his ascendancy and his his comfortability with just being the man. Like, you know, we've seen him in the playoffs multiple times now, but I think, gosh, that, that Monk and hire was just – the best thing that could happen for him. Cause I think it's just giving him confidence to do everything. And then also nothing like do what needs to be required for the play. And then in moments rise above. Cause you know, there's the, all these play action plays where he gets out of the pocket and he is looking beyond where he used to look and beyond any, where anyone thinks he's looked um, to make a play down the field with his arm. Like he's looking for the last minute open receiver and he's, you know, he, he's waiting and waiting, waiting, and then he's taken off. But then he's just mastered the art of being slippery and, like, not taking big hits. He can tell – you can tell in his mind he understands that the game – you know, there's such a cliche in the game of 60 minutes. I've got to stay alive with the, my decision-making for 60 minutes. However many plays, average, on average, the offense runs, I've got to just stay alive, give my team a shot. But then there's the moments he's recognizing – the five to 10 moments where I've got to just rise above. I loved the visual shot of he's missed. He missed likely over the middle low with, you know, they had safety help. They batted the ball and immediately. He, he and likely just on this, this, this brainwave, he's like, bro, you know, up, up top next time, up top next time. He's like, I got you. I got you. And then the next drive, he throws him a floater. He's got one-on-one -on -one coverage. That's trust. That's just this innate ability to like, Man, I get you. He understands the game on another level. He understands that, you know, that that man on man um, give and take. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a it's a marvel to see, man. I've been a fan of him since he was drafted. You know, it, it sucks that you're a, you become a fan and then you feel like you got to defend him to the the original, the Skip Bayless of the world who just like are going for hot takes about him as a black quarterback. And you're like, bro, it's all it's always been there on film. Y'all right. were committed to the hot take. And I think you just were had blinders on about what he is and what he could be. And fine, you play that game. I don't want to play that game. I want to watch and enjoy him grow. I'm not going to put the pressure and the, the unbalanced expectation on him about winning and comparing him to other quarterbacks and what he is and what he isn't. I'm enjoying him for what he is. And he's, he's, a, he's ascended this year. And he, they're uh, far and away the best team. Um, so he's got incredible, you know, talent around him. The defense keeps him you know, in the game and gives him opportunities. But, you know, this is his team. And I just love him being himself in press conferences and from, you know, from black men who've in, in different situations, we've, we've coached with, we, we figured out ways to just kind of do what we need to do. And he's just like, bro, this, this is me. Like I, I'm going to play this game with uh, an incredible amount of, of execution. I'm going to be the best version of myself, but I'm going to be me. Uh, through and through. I mean, one of my favorite teammates is Marshawn. Everyone loves Marshawn just because, like, this is the most real 24-7 dude you ever met. And Lamar has, like, you can see the comfortability in that with himself at an even more important position than quarterback in the United States, in the NFL. All that stuff doesn't matter. He's just doing what he needs to do, and he's doing it well. I, th I think one thing that people kind of, like, disregarded with Lamar and how fast of a start he got off into his career because – even when he was a rookie, like, it wasn't clean at all uh, after he came in for Flacco and Flacco got injured. But you could still see glimpses of, like, the overall picture starting to come together. He played for an NFL coach in college. Like, Bobby True. Petrino coached for the Falcons for yeah. 12, 12 games until he wrote a letter and said goodbye in the middle of the night. But what have you, like, he was still prepared by someone who had coached at the NFL level before. I think that that kind of matters when we're talking about, like, how prepared – some of these co these college quarterbacks are because that that seemed, to me that's when I got so upset with the draft discourse around Lamar because there's a lot of quarterbacks where you can look at where they played at in college and what kind of system they played in and you're like oof that's tough might not be able to immediately just apply all of this to the NFL but Lamar he came from an offense where you actually could and but 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 he happened to be too athletic, you know, or or being the best athlete on the field somehow became a negative for him. And now I think it's cool to see that growth from like that point up until now, where you know after the game on Sunday uh, or on Saturday, excuse me, Harbaugh he was like at halftime basically. Mm -hmm. Lamar came 
and ripped into the entire team with <laughs> phrases that I cannot repeat at this press conference. And then he kind of spearheaded the, mo- the halftime adjustments for the Ravens offense in the second half, helping them pick up the blitzes, you know, maybe a little bit more outside runs than they did in the first half. Uh, Harbaugh gave him a lot of credit for that. So clearly he's figured out how to not just be a leader in terms of like presenting a good face for the organization and being that guy, but also like giving you tangible tips on how we can get this thing across the finish line and try to get to a Super Bowl. So I'm, 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 I'm really happy for him that he's been able to overcome a lot of like crap that people were saying about him. Cause clearly he's one of the most complete quarterbacks in the league today. I won't, I won't even mention the guy's name. Cause I think it's obvious. It's, you know, it, people have heard it enough by now, but like we had discourse about, Josh Rosen and Sam Darnold in that draft, bro. Like they weren't, they didn't just end up as mid tier starting quarterbacks. They both ended up one is washed out the league and one is a career backup. And we had such thorough, you know, discourse about Lamar, who you just mentioned played in a pro style offense with a former NFL head coach, like, we just lost the plot, not you know, the royal we we in the media. We lost the plot. I wasn't in the media at the time, but I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> just say we y'all. Lost the plot. <laughs> yeah. Just to see him come into his own as, you know, that stuff in the locker room, you know, I, as a player, I got to see that stuff. But now on the outside, on the other side, the odds of us seeing that are low, we're always gonna hear, you know, secondhand accounts of that. But that is the the ultimate step of that's what the Tom Brady's did. That's what the Aaron Rodgers did, the Eli Mannings, the Peyton Mannings was that taking the reins of the team, even from a guy like John Harbaugh, who's as historied and, 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 you know, has the the experience. Lamar's like, no, I know exactly what's going on. I have the pulse of this team. Uh, I know what we need in this moment. He doesn't do that every game. I imagine he seems more laid back most of the time, but when it's necessary, he comes through and you can see the team respond to it. And that's the ultimate sign of a leader is their, their grip on their team. And uh, I, you know, I couldn't praise him enough, man. I'm, I'm rooting for him absolutely, uh, just to like the not so the nonsense will stop because you can't say anything if he wins this. Like you can't anymore. They'll find a way, but we just we get to further laugh it off and be like, all right, you're you're bugging. So I just I'm rooting for him in that regard. Yeah, it is kind of crazy that like we're here on a player who by age 27 will have two MVPs under his belt. It's just like, man, like, do we like football or do we like uh, arguing? Bro, that's like, you know like, do you like football? You talk about it like you, man, yeah, I can't agree Same more. the that. Bachelor, bro. Man, yeah, I got you for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last thing before we, we get into some of the uh, uh, stuff for, from, for next week and what's coming down the playoffs. How much would it cost you to redo what? the kind of weekend that Jason Kelsey had where he was <laughs> shirtless all over Buffalo having a good time with Bills fans. And I think he was even shirtless in the suite with Taylor Swift mm. as the Chiefs kind of dragged that along. Like how, how, what, what kind of state would your life have to be in where you feel comfortable doing something like that? I mean, that, <laughs> that to me looks like a man with a lot of money in the bank. He's got his <laughs> wife and kids and he just, got the the piano lifted off his back of of 13 NFL seasons and I it wouldn't take a lot for me to do that but I, <laughs> I see where I see the position is in he's in because of kind of the alleviation of, of just the stress assuming he's retiring at this point he hasn't announced it we're kind of assuming but uh on one hand that's very lineman energy like I'm, I've been lying my whole life there's a certain level where we just want to cut up um you know, we, we're used to just being more reserved. We stay in our little group. We don't get the notoriety. And that's him just cutting up, and I'm all for that. And then, uh, you know, I, was, I saw a clip of, of Chris Long, their teammates in Philly, um, just talking about that's kind of how he is all the time. And so I, I respect him, you know, just doing what he needs to do. <laughs> and, you know, it would take me being around other other big dudes to do it. I don't need to be the only, only thick brother out there with my shirt <laughs> off, but – you, you give me my retirement, you give me, a, you know, open bar. And, you know, if I'm supporting my brother too, that's the thing. Oh, like, yeah. If that's I'm watching different. my brother, like, I don't care what you say. Like, I'm out here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's just, so I, 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 I like that. He, like, he's kind of let loose like that. Yeah. How you think Patrick Mahomes can get them back to a Super Bowl? Because 
I would, I guess my, my forever take is, yeah, of course he's, he's Patrick Mahomes, yeah. but that Ravens defense is tough. It's oh, you tough. mean specifically this weekend? Um, this yeah, weekend, I think, yeah. I think Baltimore should be favored. Their, their, their team top to bottom, I think is more complete. Um, Kansas City's defense has been a top defense. And I think we've had a hard time, you know, as we described the chiefs, because the last five, six years, it's been so Pat Mahomes led, so reliant on the offense, scoring, putting up big points, being creative. The shift has been that this defense has carried them, truly carried them, like top two in total defense, top two in scoring defense. And they've had to rely on this defense because after Travis Kelsey, Pat Mahomes has, doesn't, hasn't had a reliable target. And so, yeah, again, we're talking about quarterbacks who rise above the game. He does that on a day on a game by game basis. But there's limits to that ultimately with this is the ultimate team sport. And so he's doing everything he possibly can. But when he lays the ball early in the season in Kadarius Tony's hands to convert a, a, a crucial third and third down, and he just the dude drops it, there's just limits to what Pat Mahomes can do. And so the shift this year has been this is a defensive front running team. And ultimately, yes, the defense is going to keep them in it, but Pat Mahomes is going to have to go Superman at some point. It's just in the past, it was seven, eight times a game. Now it's going to be like four, five, six just times a game with the defense, a guy like Lajarius Sneed locking up Tyree kill. And then, and then last week, you know, them doing, keeping Josh Allen from uh, having to pass over 20 yards for most of the game, like the defense. And then we're not used to that. We literally got so used to in five years. It's amazing how quick it happened to like, Oh, the offense is the strength. The offense is going to carry them. And this year it's completely flipped on its head. And we were kind of in denial for 12, 14 weeks of what actually we were watching. Yeah. The, the one that comes back to my mind is the drop by Marcus falls to Scanley at the end of the Philly game. It was like, dude, that's right in your hands, right? Like, your hands. What, he, what do you do more as Pat Mahomes? And so this is a team game. He needs that, that, that guy to make that catch. And they kind of came through this past weekend. And you're like, Oh, yeah. there, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's the, there's that offense that we used to know. And like, they were, they were a Michael Harvey fumble away from scoring 34 points uh, against Buffalo in that game. So it you can never you can never fully count out. Like as long as you got 15 back there, you can never fully count them out. And I know Ravens defense is elite of the elite. They just absolutely kill the Texans offense. Um, I don't think the Texans ran a play inside the Ravens 25 yard line. The only touchdown they had was uh, the punt return before halftime. So. Look, and that was that was the offense that scored 45 against the Browns the week before. So it's going to be tough for the Chiefs, but you got Mahomes. It can be done. All right, we'll get into more of the Final Four playoff teams and talk more about that after a quick break from our sponsors. And we're back. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Exemplist. Joined by Marshall Newhouse, former NFL offensive lineman. And right now I'm going to put Marshall on the spot. We were going to rank the final four playoff offensive lines, which is tough because to me, like when I start thinking of the groups, there's like a clear number one, which is Detroit in terms of just like how, like the total power that they have. They don't really seem to have any flaws. They've invested a lot of money and draft picks into that. They're like as good as they should be based on the investments that they've made. The other three, though, you have Baltimore, Kansas City, and San Francisco. If you had to start, you know, piecing together which groups you'd rather have, where would you go? Uh, you said after Detroit. Uh, I think after Baltimore. Detroit. Baltimore is right after them, just especially relying on the health, relating to health. You know, Ronnie Stanley's has just a, you know, unfortunately, it's gonna it's gonna mar his his career as just a super talented guy. He can still you know make up for. It. He's got a lot a lot more in him. Um, but based on their health, I like them a lot. And with the fit that like we talked about earlier, Kevin Zyler's an old, old Wiley vet at guard, but he's as consistent as they come. Um, you know, the, them having to fill that hole from the Marshall Yana days um, was no small task. And he, either he's not the same guard, but he's, he's absolutely capable. So they've got a, they've got a pretty good group. And again, a group that fits what they do well. Um, and then after that, I say San Francisco, you know, it's, it's top heavy with Trent Williams. The left side is the strength. The right side has had some struggles, 
but you know, in their scheme, you know, San Francisco is so reliant on their weapons doing what they need to do and being healthy. So when they have, you know, we'll see how Debo's health report comes out. Uh, when Debo's doing any stuff, when CMC is healthy, uh, when Ayuk's healthy, and they can lean on, you know, Shanahan scheming, literally scheming stuff for Trey Williams, which is just you've never you've never seen that before in the NFL. Rarely do people scheme for a tackle, but they'll scheme stuff for him, specific tosses and uh, lead plays with with Kittle out of the backfield and Juice Chick. Um, so San Francisco after that, and then Kansas City. Kansas City was already shaky on that on the on the tackles, you know, they had two free agent uh, signings in Jawan and well, Donovan who's come back healthy. And he's, he, I think he lifted them up a little bit, but they might be talking about missing Joe Tooney with a pec injury. Um, Creed Humphrey, who's I think a top three, top five center, but uh, the, you know, they've, they've, they've been the most inconsistent over the, over the season. And, you know, Pat Mahomes is the type of guy who covers up for that. Um, there's an incredible play uh, or, you know, they brought a blitz, which, you know, is meant to overload the line. But Pat Mahomes just smoothly moves. He, he rips the ball through, moves, sets his feet, throws a strike across the off the field, about 20 yards down the field. That's what he's been doing all season around his O-line. I don't know who it was who was talking about Mahomes specifically where, you know, he knows on any given play or any given game, like where there's a little bit of a leak leakage. So he preemptively, he's either backpedaling a little more, giving himself space, or he's – peripherally eyeing, Hey, we're, am I going to roll out, step up if the right tackle, man, it's, it's, it's not looking like a good matchup this week. And he does an incredible job with that goes to his credit for his processing power, which is crazy where he's thinking about everything else, calling the play, setting the formation coverages. And he's still got a little bit of a, a, a ear for where's a little bit of a weakness. How do I preemptively, you know, move contort my body or just prepare for that. So, yeah, I think Detroit, then Baltimore, then San Francisco, then Kansas City. I think that's a good order. Um, would you say earlier about Ronnie and his injuries and then, like, using Trent as a weapon? It makes me, like, sad because when you think about when Ronnie first got to the NFL, and especially, like, the 2019 season when Lamar won his first MVP, like, they were kind of doing similar stuff where they would say, all right, Ronnie – We'll pull you. You go out and get out in space on the edge, and then we'll run R Lamar Jackson right behind you. And he was so damn good back then that that could work. Um, and, you know, luckily for him, like, he's been able to get back to a spot where he's playing um, most of the snaps, maybe not, like, quite the same way as he used to. But, so like, when you have a player like that, like, you know, peak Ronnie Stanley, like a Trent Williams— it really does change the math on what you can do. Cause you know, I, I don't know if you remember the clip from this year where I don't remember what team the 49ers were playing, but Trent was like out in space on maybe like some pin pool or something like that. And he got in front of a defensive back and the defensive back like actively ran away from him <laughs> down the yeah. field. And in the post game press conference, Trent was like, I've never seen anything like that. You know, usually they'll try to go low or they'll try to dodge you like side to side, but just a straight run away from me, like, and give up space down the field. That was the first time that that ever happened. So, like, I think even that's something you can watch out for when you get into, like, the 49ers-Lions game. Like, are they going to use, you know, Trent, a, like, a weapon like that and get him out in the space and knock some people down? Because uh, I think when you get that level of skill as a blocker behind, or uh, you know, in front of a Christian McCaffrey, in front of Lamar Jackson, in front of someone that's that talented, the ball in their hands, it feels like, you can do anything because you have like a two way go for however the block plays out in front of you. And you know, that that guy with the ball in his hand is skilled enough and talented enough to read it out. So I feel like Trent is just one of those guys who he was born to play for the Shanahan's and, you know, cause he played for Mike in Washington. Uh, and obviously that went well until it didn't, you know, and he had his issues with the organization. Then he finds his way to Kyle who obviously put him right back in the perfect spots uh, for him to kind of continue what should be a, a Hall of Fame career for him, so I, uh, I think I think I'm I'm in lockstep with you on the offensive offensive line rankings. I'll go Detroit first because you got three first rounders up there: Decker, Ragno, Sewell. They filled in the gaps pretty nicely on the interior between those guys. Uh, then San Francisco, or excuse me, then Baltimore, then San Francisco, and then uh, Kansas City. 
but I, I, I feel, I don't think any of them are necessarily bad units. I feel like, well, it's hard to get this far without, with a bad, like a truly bad offensive it's, line. It's, it's dang near impossible because you would see a lot of Band-Aids. You'd see so many uh, chips and, and full line slides and you'd see offenses that were kind of just, you know, a sputtering. Yeah, when your offensive line, at least, you know, if not three, if not four, the guys are, are pretty, pretty uh, stout. It's just it, in this level with Chris Jones is across from you everywhere. And now Aiden Hutchinson is across from you. The post is like, you need guys that eventually, yeah, you help, you, you build that stuff in so you can get, get your shot off, but you need guys who can win you one-on-ones eventually. And uh, what you said about Trent is, is perfect. Like, it's a shame. Trent is such a weapon. It's a shame if there ever was an offensive coordinator who didn't see him as a weapon. And just if, if he's just dropped back passing 40 times a game, it's a waste. To me, it's a complete waste yeah. of what he can do. And so, yeah, getting him in space, they have an incredible lead play where there's an open end, but either an H-back or a tight end comes in motion and basically allows Trent to run full speed. So when you have an open uh, defensive end as a tackle, you know, you're – and you have to zone block him or something like that. Yeah, you, you want to run at him full speed, but there's unless you have a guard coming on the inside, um, you have to protect against an inside move. Well, with the play, this specific scheme that Kyle does, is kind of this lead uh, stretch play. Um, Trent's protected on his inside and his outside. So he literally gets to screw his cleat in the ground, and all 330 of him gets to run full speed at a defensive end. If the defensive end stays, he gets trucked by Trent and George Kittle, and if he makes an inside move, he gets trucked by, by the fullback. And so that allows all those guys to play fast. You see Chris McCaffrey get a look where he's like, he's got three of his dogs in front of him. He gets to make his cut and up the field. And, you know, it's, it's an incredible scheme that they throw in that allows guys just to play fast and use their power um, and not have to think too much. And so they throw a lot of those in there. And I love that they, they value Trent's abilities enough to give him opportunities like that because – there's coaches who would just say, hey, let's let's run simple zone. And yeah, Trent would excel at that still, but it's it's not maximizing the totality of, of kind of what he can do. It's it's very unique. Uh, and at his age, it's very uh, impressive. And so, yeah, I, I love that Shanahan sees that, has seen that, and has valued that throughout his career. And then, yeah, what you're saying about um, lines needing, you know, at th- this point they need to be cohesive as well. Um, they have, you know, these defense coordinators, when you get the playoffs, they're scheming what you have done throughout the regular season and now two playoff games, like what you do best, they've got two answers for. And so you need guys who can communicate, who can kind of operate above the fray uh, when things are kind of crazy. Did you see the look that Bowles put on the field with Vita Vea in like standing up, floating around like that type is what defensive coordinators are now doing. Um, in certain situations. And so you've got to have a group uh, who works well together um, and then also individuals who can win one-on-one matchups when time calls. Yeah. I I have a group chat where we, you know, talk about nerdy football stuff all the time. And the, the, the lead pledge he talked about with the 49ers reminds me of a take that we have where 21 personnel is still a meta in the NFL. If you have Mm. a fullback, bro, if you have a fullback that knows where he needs to go, yes, it's just so hard to stop that because you can insert like new a new blocker at the line of scrimmage after things have already started to sort out a little bit. And the Ravens, they have like the biggest fullback in the game that Ricard, also man. blows. Yeah, he's crazy. <laughs> he's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That they they found the perfect role for Ricard, I think, in this new offense because at times under Greg Roman, like look, he's he's a good player. But is, he's not someone you want to be throwing the ball to a for whole sure. lot. For sure. You know, he's 300 pounds. He's a former defensive tackle. I just <laughs> have to be athletic enough to move in space like that. So just get behind him. Let him blow some holes open. And then maybe some short yard stuff, he can get the ball. But we're going to turn our backs on the real football players real quick and talk about the quarterbacks that are left in the playoffs. You know, the guys who get to steal all the shine from uh, the real football players doing work out front. Brock Purdy discourse is back. I don't really know where you stand on Brock Purdy. I find a lot of it to be tiresome, mostly on the side of people who were like actually saying he's like the best player on this offense and the reason why they were scoring a whole bunch of points when I think when you actually sit down and watch them, it's not not quite true. But he's not like a he's not he's obviously not a dumpster fire of a quarterback because 
look, it, it, we the, you you absolutely can be bad enough where even a, an offensive setup like this could struggle. He's not that bad, but he's not, you know, he's not a Lamar Jackson. He's not a Patrick Mahomes. And I think that that's also fine too. What in general, what did you think about how he played on Saturday? And will that performance be enough to get them to a Super Bowl title? Yeah, I think he played below his standard this season. I don't know if he's playing to his his average or if that was just a bad game for him. I mean, it was not spoken about enough. Maybe I just want to listen to the broadcast closely enough about what the rain did to his uh, his grip and his, and you know his ability to throw as accurately as as he had all season. Um, and so he had a bad game. I mean, I I think you can characterize it as a bad game with a timely drive in the fourth quarter. It was mostly a bad game. He, I mean, a lot of sailing throws that I hated overemphasizing measurables because I went through the combine. I hated that meat market type. Like, it, you know, I think it was overemphasized for a lot of situations, but Brock Purdy has nine and a quarter hands. And in the, that rain, it looked, I mean, there's the, the slow-mo clip of him taking a snap subconsciously, wiping his towel in, in motion, which is kind of impressive, but you could tell how much the, the, the conditions were bothering him. And then on top of that, you know, he is a guy who, you know, we, 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 we were so bad about everything needs to be binary where he's either good or he's bad. And like, no, he's, he's a good to above average to his ceiling can even be a really good quarterback, but yes, he is not Lamar, Pat or Josh. And talking about him in that framework was just, contorting what he actually was good at. And so, yeah, he was leading in statistics, but what we've said about San Francisco and that has borne itself out with the results was that when they have everybody there doing what Kyle Shanahan needs, when all his chess pieces are in their position, they're an incredible team offense. And in that team offense, Brock Purdy is really, really good. As soon as McCaffrey's gone, Debo's gone, these guys are out, banged up, and he has to elevate above, uh, you know, the sum of their parts. That's not his strength, at least not yet. Again, I, I give him credit because he's still a young quarterback. People kind of give him crap for that. But, yeah, him saying he was on a, the level of a, a Mahomes where he could take over the game is just foolish. And anyone who really, like, understood um, and weren't prisoners of the moment knew that was foolish. But it's not fair to him because he was playing good right. ball. And that's the that's got nothing to do with him. That's got out. That's outside noise. <laughs> we just couldn't have a healthy conversation, and it was just dumb. And yeah, you're right. The discourse, it's just hot air, man. And so, but coming into this game, Detroit, their secondary, their corners are susceptible. Like there's going to be, there's going to be opportunities there. San Francisco should be favored at home, um, but you know, Brock Purdy may just make ill-advised decisions, and you know, he we made a lot about him. With his, time, with his anticipatory throws across the middle, those deep digs that he likes to throw well in advance and lob it over the, the second uh, level linebackers in front of the safeties. He's really good at him, but those plays only come, you know, when you've got a play action that's working, when you've got a, a, a defense that's respecting the run. And so, if they don't get McCaffrey going early, that stuff just wasn't open. And then on a, on a day like there was the other day where he just didn't have the best grip, you know, he seems to be – he kind of falls down a little bit. So I think the weather is supposed to be nicer, so I think we'll see a better Brock Purdy. And then also the DBs for, for Detroit aren't as good as uh, last week's DBs. And so I think he'll have a pretty good game. Um, but in the moment when you need him to – we've got to go get it. You know, hit between him and Goff – I'm not sure he's better. I think he is better than golf, but like, you know, in the NFC, that's just a matter of who you're going against. I don't think that's a matter right. of comparing him to the elites. Yeah. Yeah. Cause all, all the quarterbacks in the AFC, like one thing that's, that's cool about, I think one thing that's cool about like where we are in the AFC is like Pat Mahomes, he's going to have to run into Josh Allen. He's going to have to run to Lamar Jackson and vice versa. Joe Burrow, when he gets back healthy, we've already seen, uh, those teams don't like each other very much. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you, you know, more for your experience is like when you get into a game like this and you're an offensive lineman, you're preparing for, okay, we got Aiden Hudson. Well, we got Nick Bosa. We got, you know, 
Eric Armstead and all the depth that they've created? Like, what's kind of going through your mind during the week when you're getting ready for a game like that? Well, you're looking at kind of what the offensive coordinator is hoping to do. Like, you know, they've they've got quality control guys and people who are scheming and they're they're running down, you know, situationally. Third down, what are we going to get? What are they? What are the tendencies? Where how are we going to attack them? What should you expect? And uh, you you know, as a lineman, you, you see those guys. You, you put a red dot on them, just like that's a it's a dude. You give him his, his proper respect, but you understand like, hey, you know, no one's no one's superhuman. But you're 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 working with your guard next to you, your center who's making who's setting the protection about help and how we're gonna you know orchestrate help in the moment. Are we you know when when we are sliding to my guy, I have you know this guy who's a red dot who's the dog. Um, I'm okay, and we'll figure it out. We'll try to get uneven matchups, two on or a three on two, uh, a two on one, and you do that as often as possible. I mean, you, you talk about a guy like Aaron Aaron Donald. That every single play, every single week, offensive lines prepare to have four minimum hands on him, and I, four I caught hands and eyes, hands and four eyes on him um, at every time. And so you you see uh, down the roster. Who's the guy who's producing that way? If they have more than one, all right, we're going to have moments where they're, they're, I think uh, OC is going to build in chip help uh, or we're going to have screens and how do we execute those to stay on track. And then ultimately there will be third downs where we got to go four wide. We got to go empty. All right. You know, if, if, you know, if a center and a guard have a, have a defensive tackle, a nose technique, and they blunt him and they slow his momentum down. I'm telling my guard, as soon as you see his momentum slow down, you turn and you open up and you and you come help. Like you be presence there because the defensive ends see that. And if they want to spin inside, if they want to bull rush, they know early on if my guard comes and cleans him up, takes his ribs out, he, that's in his head for the rest of the game. Even a, a elite player, that's in his head for the rest of the game. And so you just you start to prepare your games. Um for that there's little games within the games you, you know you're like how are we adjusting when they bring six and we only have five are we you know a lot of that's up to the quarterback is he gonna slide us left away from the pressure he's gonna float left a little bit i mean that baker clip uh where they had it empty it just didn't seem like everyone was on the same page about what was expected in the empty formation but as long as everyone's on the same page we just live with it you know if the qb likes to look we i remember with aaron Rodgers, we were playing in the nfc north against chicago they were doing that was early days, a lot of the double A mug stuff. And like sometimes they bring a safety down the line of scrimmage. You can't be right, but you can be the most right for what you need. And so we would say, hey, <laughs> it's a full line slide left. Aaron knows the hots on the right. So either he's got a hot receiver who's who's adjusting, route adjusting right away, or he's literally taking the snap, drifting left to get by himself more time. And so it's just a matter of those little sm- small games of preparation. To just give yourself the best chance to win, and you know you're not you can't win the whole game in one play. You're trying to win moments. You're trying to win these big uh, situations where they they got their best call, their best guys in the field. You've got your best call. Give our our dog. Uh, you know the quarterbacks they make things go. Give Pat Mahomes the best chance to get it to right now where she rides to Travis Kelsey. A half a second means everything, and those are the the small little things where. A little bit extra effort, a little bit of preparation as far as a guard helping a tackle, a, a guard helping a center. Um, it, those are the difference between winning and losing. And people lose sight of that because there's so much else going on with receivers and routes and coverages. But that stuff allows playmakers to make plays. Yeah, sometimes I feel like, especially during the games, people don't realize how much of a cohesive product this is for all 11 players on the field. Like there's, there's a sack that comes to my mind from Sunday with the, the Bucks lions game where like it looked like Aiden Hutchinson just got off free, right? And people were like, oh, well, why wouldn't you block Aiden Hutchinson? Well, think about it. Like, if you go back and watch the play, I think they were in empty protection and the linebacker, he was on the line of scrimmage about to blitz. So the right tackle stepped down and looked like they're about to send six versus five, which means like the guy most outside is going to be the quarterback's man. And they kind of played it they played it correctly, you know, because the, the linebacker ended up bailing after he stepped down. But still, Baker should be able to realize that that's his man. Baker realized what was going on, and he looked for his hot, and there was no one there. You know, so then he ends up double clutching because, well, I don't want to throw it because it's going to be interception. 
but I need to throw this ball. And by the time you have a chance to make a second decision, you're on your ass because Aiden Hutchinson's really good. And he's never going to miss a free run at the quarterback. <laughs> right. And then everyone's just like, oh, well, why didn't they block Aiden Hutchinson? Because it's a little bit more complicated yeah, than that. It's, more nuanced it's that. not always the the one plus one. I play a bunch of Madden and I, I know what's going on. <laughs> it's just sometimes, sometimes, you, sometimes the defense makes a really good play call that you don't have an answer for, and someone messes up, and you take a negative play. You want to control as much as you control, but you're like, they get paid too. Like, that defensive coordinator found a little uh, uh, a tendency we had. He, he was leveraged against us. It's third down and nine. He knows there's a certain amount of time to, to run a route to the sticks at nine yards. Let me get on them before that and let the, let them, you know, not let them make a decision. So sometimes the chess match is just one. And yeah, as a quarterback, you're like, all right, you teach those guys. Sometimes that happens. Um, don't make the big mistake. Take the sack, we'll punt, we'll move on. And so that sounds like defeatist, but it's like, that's the reality sometimes. Every play can't be a, a Hail Mary because you you, you you made the sliders go down on Madden. Like, we we know y'all right. be out here cheating. Like, it, it's going to be more <laughs> like that in real game, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all, never me. I would never do something like that. I would never do something like that. Uh, you know, one, one last thing before we get out of here. Uh, I think an interesting thing about this Chiefs-Ravens game that's coming up this weekend, particularly from, like, the Ravens side, when you're dealing with the Chiefs defense, both these defensive coordinators are known for blitzing in terms of, like, how they're able to kind of manipulate protection plans to get free runners down the middle of the offensive line. Like the, I know the Ravens, they tried a few times to Patrick Queen uh, versus the Texans. Obviously, Steve Spagnuolo has been known for that for like 20 years now. It seems like being uh, just a guy who really understands the blitz game. How, you know, it's kind of the same question. Like, instead of going from the defensive line perspective, the blitzing perspective, you know, well, how are you guys preparing for that and make sure, making sure you're on your P's and Q's going to the game? Yeah, again, and it comes down to situation. You know, Mike McDonald, the defense coordinator of, of Baltimore, and then Staggs uh, for Kansas City, um, they're, they're tuned, they have certain areas where they like sending pressure, simulated pressure uh, more than than more than others. And so we have to be attuned to that and try to stay, first stay out of those situations by, you know, making smart decisions on first, second down. Um, but then, you know, in those moments, like, all right, where does he like to send pressure from? Is it all from the same level? You know, whether they walk guys up on the line of scrimmage or they're, you know, if we have a, a condensed formation, they like to disguise, you know, secondary pressure um, and stuff like that. And so we're we're preparing all week uh, for the specific type and the side they'll bring it from. Uh, we we, we kind of earmark guys who are better off blitzers. So the guys who almost they're trying to hide and not having coverage on, on critical downs where they'd rather he's a better blitzer. He, he might be a safety who's less adept at coverage but is a better pass rusher so they prefer sending him and so we're thinking about you know who are our main rushers on the defensive line because sometimes they only have three real defensive linemen out there so we're thinking big on big first and then at, who are the other two after that and so from game to game you know Patrick Queen's a guy who's an athletic to, enough to do both but tendency wise something is borne out in the stats. So they've got people who break that down. And so we know where our initial point was. I remember, you know, in Aaron, with Aaron in Green Bay, the line would have, we would do our own due diligence and pressure pickups. So we'd have an initial point. And then if he saw something that he didn't like, or he saw a matchup with Jordy and Randall Cobb on one side, he'd move our protection over to a new guy. Um, and then that would change rules for the backside. And, and so it's just being on the same page, between the line and the quarterback about who are the guys that are the most emphasized, because if they bring more than you can block, they bring more you can block. And like I said before, if we're just on the same page and Aaron knows where it's coming, or, you know, Patrick and Lamar know where it's coming from. Um, then, and the and the receivers have their heads up. Then, you know, a lot of the, 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 the answers can be there. And sometimes the answer is just a four yard route where you get the ball in his hands and then you hopefully get some yak you live to fight another down, but they just wasted a blitz. You know, they just put themselves in harm's way by having one-on-ones on the outside. They brought zero and they've got, you know, man all the way across the board. That's a potential explosive. They don't, if they, one guy misses a tackle. And so there's risk and reward. And so we're just doing our best to be prepared for who are the most likely 
And then between us and the quarterback, you know, you emphasize where you'd like to go. If you're, you know, right-handed, you want to roll right, you want to bleed right, or in this instance, you want to bleed left, depending on the hash, depending on for the red zone, low red, all that stuff. So it can get really granular. And, you know, sometimes it feels overwhelming, but there's still patterns. There's still only so many calls you can make. And so we break down their tendencies and we prepare for the most likely and get ready for any adjustments they might make. Yeah. I, th- I thought one thing that was impressive was the Ravens. They were able to kind of get a hold on those blitzes in the second half and not let it ruin and, and kind of run down. So, because the, honestly, D- D'Amico, I think he they turned up the blitz in the second half. If I, if I remember correctly, according to Next Gen Stats, uh, Lamar was blitzed on 78.5% of his dropbacks in the second half alone. I think it, it equaled out to 75% for the whole game. So, they saw something. I, w- I would be surprised if Spags blitzed at that rate because because I feel like once you get to that point, I would be a little scared. You know, you, you, to me, like you, you you hear running backs sometimes, you like you hear them talk about how they like to run against like super stacked boxes because if they can just get free, there's no right. one else that right. has to make them, that has to make something miss. Uh, and that's kind of like the same prospect to me. Of like if I'm Lamar Jackson, I see you saying six and I can wiggle away from one. Like, that's that's not a bad spot for me for a number of wise based on my athleticism based on who's trying to tackle me. So uh, I, wa- I don't think they'll blitz like 80% of the time like the Texans did, but still it's going to be coming. Last thing I have for you before we get out of here. As a former Packer, you kind of got to be a little bit impressed with what these young guys just put together this season. Because, dude, it, it wasn't just Jordan Love being young. It's you know, your your tackle duo based on Bakhtiari being out for the season. Rasheed Walker is in his second year. Zach Tom in his second or third year. Both of your tight ends that you're leaning on this year, both rookies with Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft. Your wide receivers are all rookies or second year guys. Like, how impressed were you with what they were able to kind of accomplish this year based on the fact that they don't really have a whole lot of experience playing in the NFL, let alone playing together in the NFL? Yeah, man, it was, it was incredible to see. And I think you know, if we boil it all down, it's, it's, it's a testament to what we maybe didn't see a full slate of as far as what LaFleur can do, because we remember when he got hired, it was immediately like, how are you going to cater and balance this out with Aaron Rodgers and what Aaron wants to do? And so <clears throat> behind the scenes, I'm sure there's a lot of talk back and forth and, and figuring it out. And listen, they were still successful. Um, but this season, you can very much see what LaFleur wants to do Every game, you can see what he wants to lean into uh, 12, 13 personnel, play action, pre pre snap motion, you know, Jordan Love, you know, throwing deep over routes, using the tight ends, Aaron Jones and slashing opportunities with the tight end slicing back. Um, And so, them at that full go with what LaFleur wants to do, I think opens up because you've got young guys who don't know any better. So they're just going to do what you coach them to do, which, you know, it sounds obvious, but you know, sometimes veterans get set in their ways. And so they're harder to work with in a system that maybe might be new to them. And so you get these wide receivers who are trying to prove themselves and they're, be, they're supposed, they're where they're supposed to be. When a, if a QB is expecting you, you know, on this side of the numbers for a timing route, you've got to be there. And you can tell that these guys have just gained confidence as the season goes on. And then ultimately Jordan Love, this is his first full year starting. And so things were, you know, they were okay. They were, they were tepid through the first half of the season. They were figuring it out. This is ultimately his rookie season. They were figuring it out. And then you saw him hit the, the turbo button because he's like, oh, you know, I, I kept saying it's like Neo realizing, oh, I am him. And he's just doing stuff, again, uh, playing above the scheme because we're seeing LaFleur call the games that he wants to call. But then sometimes things just aren't there. The coverage is is what it is. You can't force it. So Jordan Love's like, all right, I'm going to throw the ball at the running back's feet, live to find another day. Or I've got a one-on-one matchup, and I'm going to put the ball in such a place where either my guy gets it or no one gets it. And you see him gain that confidence as they go along, and they're just set up so well. It's uh, it's an incredible thing that they've done this now. It seems like for the third time, finding a quarterback, letting him sit, uh, it's, it's, you know, and, you know, I, I tweeted about like, why don't more people just have the patience to do this? And that ultimately it's just that it's patience. It's greed. It's time greed. It's like, we want things right now. We want them to look a certain way. We're enamored with this player um, and what he could be. We want to see what that looks like right now. And when 
we we forget that this is a team game and all these pieces yeah. talk with each other. And it's it takes some balls to two times in a row take a quarterback in the first round when you For have sure. a Hall you, of Fame guy. You you gotta yeah. be uh, you know you gotta have your HR department on 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 point. You're you're you gotta be able to just trust that the, these egos eventually will get worked out. Now someone's not gonna be happy, but you just the stability of the organization has to be that where if the unhappy right. guy. You know, we're speaking in you know obvious terms, but if the unhappy guy just has to has to get a change of scenery, you're still okay. Like no, nothing is crumbling. You know, it might seem on the outside that things are so stressed and tense, but Green Bay was like, "Yeah, Aaron, we you know Brett did this too. He fussed and he fought, and you know this is where we're going." And so you you know, I'm sure that they could have talked themselves into signing him for another year or two, but that you know they just they stood on business. And not everyone has yeah. the patience to do that. It's easy to deal with an unhappy person when you can remove the unhappy person from the scenario. It's a lot easier. Hey, oh, this Aaron Rodgers thing is causing some problems for us now. Got to get out of here. <laughs> but uh, Marshall, thank you for coming on. Uh, I, I know you're not like doing traditional media work yet, but is there anything you want to let people know you're working on that might be coming in the near future? I mean, right right now, I'm I'm working into that stuff. Uh, still, find me on Twitter at mnewhouse73, and I'll be on more shows like yours and um, a lot of our our mutual friends doing doing uh, football analysis. And uh, the plans do more and more. So yeah, you'll be seeing me around. All right, and we'll see you at the Super Bowl too. Yes, sir. Uh, Send us a voicemail, speakpipe.com, slash zero blitz, ask a question, how does take, make fun of my draft grades, we'll listen and reply to them on the show. We're back next week with another episode of The Exemplist, like every Tuesday. I'm Charles McDonald. You can find me on Twitter at 4 Marshall, like you said, is on Twitter at mnewhouse73. Producer Stone Rochelle behind the glass. You can find him on Twitter at SJ Rochelle. And we will see you next week.